Welcome to the Global Geography Lecture at York University to celebrate Black History Month. My name is Professor Allison Bain, and I'm the coordinator of the Global Geography Program. It's an absolute pleasure for me to introduce to you my colleague, Professor Joseph Mensa. Professor Mensa was the chair of the former Department of Geography, and he teaches our first year course, Geography 1000, The World Today, which is a course that you would take would you, were you to join our program here at York. Professor Mensa was born and raised in post completing his PhD in geography at the University of Alberta. His current research focuses on the integration and transnationalism of African immigrants in Canada. And his last co-authored book was entitled Boomerang, How Racism Affects Us All. We hope you enjoy the lecture today. It's entitled Getting to Know the Geographies of Africa, Confronting Popular Stereotypes. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Alison. Thank you, Rohina. And thank you to all the students who are, um, have made time to listen to this lecture. I will just go right away. As uh, my colleague said, the title is Getting to Know Africa. Basically, how do we confront the popular stereotypes surrounding this particular continent? Okay, now let me start with some basic geographic information on Africa for you. The continent has about 49 countries on the continent. I say about, the about is not said just uh, by accident. I use it decidedly. In fact, because the countries on the African continent keep on shifting. Uh, some are splitting up. You know, uh, Southern Sudan recently uh, broke off from the mainland Sudan. Uh, Western Sahara is still a disputed land between Morocco and the Arab state. Okay, and some Eritrea bro broke off from Ethiopia in 1993. So these things are going on. So at any particular point as a geographer, if somebody asks you how many countries are in Africa, you just have to be very careful the way you answer a question like that. But in any case, we have about 49 countries on the continent, and it also has six islands. So the, these are the countries, of course. So I was mentioning Western Sahara. You see Western Sahara here, it's a disputed country. You see Southern Sudan just recently created. Let me just give you some tour and see some of the interesting things that you may wanna keep in mind. There is this a small town here, Lesotho. It is enclosed completely in, in the Republic of South Africa. You go to the west here, you can find Gambia. Also a small country enclosed completely by Senegal. You go here, you have another tiny country here, Djibouti, more sandwiched between Eritrea and Somalia. So there are such countries, okay? And then of course, countries that are changing their names. Swaziland recently changed its name to Eswatini. Burkina Faso used to be the upper voter. So these are things that keep on going on and on and on in the African. So it makes the geography of it a bit fluid. So you have to be mindful of that, okay? Now, these are the islands. They are six main islands. Of course, the biggest one in geographic term is always the Madagascar. In fact, some of you, when we're doing geography in, uh, uh, back home, they will say Africa, if you draw Africa map and you don't have the Madagascar, and that is a mistake. And anyway, Madagascar is a, it's a, in fact, Ireland bigger than some of the countries, actually. You have Mauritius, Comoros, Seychelles, Sao Tome, and Principe, and then Quebec, or they call it Quebec. Okay, these are the islands that you may wanna keep in mind. Now, because of the size of the continent and the many, the multiplicities of countries in it, the, the, the number of countries in it, you expect it to be a bit diverse in terms of its development. Okay, so when you are talking about Africa, very often people just generalize. But you, right now, you know there are about 54 countries in the, on the continent. So if you generalize, then you are asking for trouble. If you do look at development, for instance, you have what we call the HDI, which means the Human Development Index. Generally, 
is a combination of your income, your healthcare, and your educational system. You put it together and you have a metric. So it ranges from zero to one. In fact, we compute HDR for the whole of the world, all the countries, you can rank all of them. And then if you are getting closer to one, then it means that you are very developed. So let's see in, on the African continent, we have Mauritius, which is an island, 0 0.79. That is close, very, very developed. In fact, Canada normally is 0 0.9 something, 0 0.92, 0 0.95. Of course, Canada is way advanced. So very close to one, then you are developed. The moment you move further and further away from one, then you are less developed. So Mauritius is 0 0.79, Botswana 0 0.73, the Republic of South Africa 0 0.7. Then you go to the bottom, you have countries like Chad 0 0.4, Central African Republic 0 0.38, Niger 0 0.33. So you can see right there, you have a lot of diversity. In fact, you can talk about diversity in terms of population size. Nigeria alone, that is why Nigeria tends to be so popular anytime people are talking about Africa. Nigeria alone has 206, in fact now actually it will be about 210 million people. The whole of the continent of Africa of all the 54 countries put together will be 1.4 billion, give or take some few, some few thousands. 1.2, so Nigeria alone, taking 206 or 210 million. You can see that it's a big chunk. Let's put it in context. Canadian population, the whole of Canada, all the provinces and all the territories put together is less than 40 million. So that you can put things in it, their proper country. In fact, the last census will put it about 38 million. So if you have Nigeria alone, 206 million, then you see how big the population is. Of course, the land is big, but nowhere near the size of Canada. Ethiopia is also equally big, 140 million. DRC, DRC Congo, Democratic Republic of Congo, used to be called the Zaire, okay? That's a population of about almost 90 million. So these are the population giants on the continent. Then you have the small, small, small places like Eswatini that I was talking about, Swaziland, 1.1 million. 1.1 million is basically the whole country's population will be about a quarter of the GTA, the whole country. Mauritius, 1.2, Equatorial Guinea, 1.4. So they are small, small, small countries in terms of population. In fact, they are small ones in terms of spatial or size, and then they are big ones. The biggest, of course, in terms of population happens to be Nigeria, okay. Countries like Egypt, they are all very big. Now, one interesting thing about Africa is this. If you want to make some generalizations, it's difficult to make generalizations, but you can actually generalize that the population of Africa is very young. In other words, it's mostly predominantly young people. It's a youthful population. So therefore, if you compute the population of all the countries, the average age for all the, each country or even all of them, normally in African countries, you are looking for an average age of about say 18 years or 19 years or 20, maximum 22. So on the African continent, each of the countries will have an average age of between 18 to 23. Put it another way. So if you walk through the streets, of any of the African countries, you are far, far more likely to encounter a young person or anybody on the street is about, say, 20 years old on average. Now let's compare it to Canada. Believe it or not, the Canadian context, and in fact, most of the advanced societies are aging. That is to say, their average age is over, say, 35, 40, 44, in fact, you are talking about 38 to 44. So that is a very uh, dramatic distinction between Africa and the advanced societies, Canada, US, Norway, Japan, Italy. In fact, Italy has a very, very big uh, average age of about 44, Japan, the same. So those, the advanced societies are actually aging. 
For us, Africa and some uh, uh, Africa is really youthful population. So you can take it in so many different concepts. So in population geography, normally you have a graph that we call the population pyramid. It is a way of representing the population in terms of the gender, male and female. You can see the males on the left, the females on the right, and then you, grade, you, you put it into categories of age groups. So what you will see is that as you, in the African context, you see the age group zero to four ages at the bottom five to nine, the younger population is the biggest. And then you see progressively it reduces nicely like a population pyramid. These are real numbers. It's not like a, a framework or some a template. No, it's a real numbers that is graph. And look at how nicely they shape into a pyramid. Okay, this pyramidal shape is what gave the name to this particular diagram. We call it the population pyramid. Now, so one interesting thing is, is that, of course, as you get to the 80s and the 90s, you, have, you don't have many people there. It, it's very, very small. But grab, what you can pay attention to or what is also interesting is that generally speaking, especially getting to the older ages, you tend to have the population getting in favor of the females. So therefore, if you take out 65 to 69, 0.8 for females, 0.9 for males, here 0.5 for females, 0.5 for females, 0.4 for males, 0.3 for females, here the same, but here 0.2, here 0.1, you can see that it's slightly. So generally, even on the African continent, you find a situation where the women live longer than men. The same thing will actually apply to Canada and advanced societies. Let me see, I have a population pyramid. This diagram is also called population pyramid. <laughs> but if you look at it, of course, you all know that it doesn't look like a pyramid. But the general name is population pyramid. It's still a population pyramid. But here you can see in the advanced society, this is for Europe. And it, the same pattern will be applicable to say Canada, the same will apply to US, any of the advanced countries. You find the bottom a bit smaller. In other words, the youthful population is smaller. It bulges out in the middle. And of course, the older population is bigger. So we are not having babies compared to the African countries. Okay, so you see the bottom is shrinking while the middle part is bulged out. Okay, and still, as I was saying, you can see, let me go back. You can see the right side or the female population getting bigger than the male. Okay. In fact, even here it shows far more clearly. Still, in the advanced societies, you find the women are living the, the men. So I always tell my students, when you sit down and you talk about men are stronger than women and this and this, macho, this, this, you have to be careful. If you are stronger than women, how can women are outliving you, outlasting you? You have to think it. It depends on how you define strength and who is stronger than who is. Any country you go, women outlive men. So you can't tell me you are the stronger, but meanwhile, you are the one who died first. Okay, so be careful with the way you, you analyze these things. Okay, now, how come we call, you still call this pyramid? We call this pyramid because when the diagram start, was first drawn, way back when, even the advanced societies, their shape looked like a pyramid. It just so happened that since the 60s, 70s, the advanced societies have moved away from the pyramidal shape. In fact, in demography, you have what they call demographic decision. We move into a shape whereby advanced societies are shrunk in terms of the number of births. But the, in that, is that, that population, demographic transit divided into about four Basis. The advanced societies are the, are the about fourth state. Africa is still between second and third state. So with time, it all depends on how you argue whether Africa will shape like this or not. But that is a different story. Now, let's, the whole idea of this topic, the main point is to sort of confront the stereotypes. Okay, so let me just define what is meant by stereotypes. A related term is prejudice. People use stereotype and prejudice interchangeably or as though they are synonyms. 
you, you will take it down for interest of time. But generally, a stereotype, you can define it a widely heard and simplified idea or image about a person or a group of people. Normally, you meet somebody, let me break it down somewhere. You meet a black person. If you are stereotyped the person, that means you don't know that person as an individual. You just, you just met the person. But you have a generalized, oversimplified idea about black people that you are projecting on that person. And for the most part, it's not true. It may be general in some way, but it may or may not apply to that person. If you don't give the person the chance or get to know the person, but you project that generalized idea that you know about a black person to that person, then you are doing what you call, you are stereotyping. You are putting a rigid definition on that person. You are taking away that person's individuality. You are not giving the person to even explain or show who or she is, but you are just, oh, you know him, a black young person, it's likely he's playing uh, basketball, even on university campuses. You can be a pro, but people see that you, oh, you are here, maybe you are the, the, the basketball player, or you are the coach, or you're running, or maybe you are cleaning the, the building. You see, that is a stereotype. That is what you mean by stereotype. It goes in almost everybody's stereotypes. Black stereotypes, white stereotypes, every country stereotype. The, the whole idea is that you have to be mindful and try to avoid that tendency. Because as you know, is an one. I mean, I've seen blacks who cannot do play basketball. You can do not do any sport. Okay, so if you want to know why people, let's say, black young people play basketball, go to Africa. They don't even play basketball. It all depends on context, circumstances. Okay, so you have to keep all this idea in mind. So stereotypes are based on over generalization. The whole idea is it denies the person's individuality. Keep that in mind. Let me just project it further and show you why stereotypes are so hard and their impact. Okay, when you stereotype, how it affects the person and how it is so difficult to get out of the impact of stereotype. Now, normally, throughout this discussion about stereotype and confronting stereotypes, one key concept you have to keep in mind is that of power. Everything in this type of analysis has to do with power and power difference. You can say power play. You can say power dynamics, power relation. It all is of power. For you to stereotype a person and have, make it have an impact, there should be a power differential. If you don't have a power, your stereotype will not go anywhere. But if you have the power, and then you stereotype the black person, we are talking about Africans and blacks, so I will use those as an example. You stereotype the black person as being lazy. Okay, you stereotype the person, so you get people are applying for a job. You see the black person in there, of course, you see the name and you see the face and all of a sudden you tag the person in your mouth, this is an African, he's lazy. So based on that stereotype, what do you do? You move from stage one from the stereotype and you discriminate. That is to say that you put your stereotype into effect. So you will not hire that black person. Because I mean, if the person is lazy, why are you going to hire a person? You want to make profit. So you won't hire. So you have implemented your stereotype. And there, the ability to implement it has something to do with power. You are the one who holds the power to hire or not to hire. So now you use and you put a business at the bottom. and economic disadvantage. Because if you are not hired into the job, obviously you will become unemployed and you are becoming low income, you endure poverty, you don't have money. Then that same fact, the fact that you are unemployed, you are poor, you are living in slums, you are living in poor conditions, is used again to tell people, you see, that is why I said the black person is lazy. Okay, so you see how the stereotype is feeding into each other. Okay, why is he lazy? Because you thought about it, and because of that, you didn't you didn't give that person the job, and because of that, 
the person is poor, and now you are using the poverty that he is living in to explain why you think he is lazy. Don't you think he is poor because you don't you didn't give him the job? Okay. And then this idea of black being lazy or African being lazy, if you ever live in Africa, <laughs> you will know that the idea of being lazy is never in anybody's. Uh, I mean, really, you wake up, you go to fetch water about four times before you go to school, you come and you, I mean, you the life there, if you're talking about somebody being lazy, then you don't know what you're talking about. And of course, even in Canada, over the years, you know that the Canadian society was first settled by the aboriginals. My people don't want to die. They jump over to the English and French. Fine. Then when the Western Europeans were coming, fine. After a period of time, they started exhausting Western European and they went to Southern Europe, Italy, uh, Spain. When they came here first, they were tagged as being lazy. All the stereotypes that are being put on blacks now, we attack on Italians. We attack on people from Portugal. We attack on people from Spain because their skin color was slightly darker. Okay, so they were lazy. They were this. I were this. Italians are this. 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 You done it to the Chinese. You done it. Okay, so this being lazy is just. And of course, later on, when people are accepted and they do it to the next group, and they are accepted and they do it to the next group. So there's nothing truthful about this. It all depends on who has power and who wants to determine what is going on. And uh, let me uh, explain it even further. Normally, stereotypes are used to tag somebody. You say you other the person, you other. You marginalize the person, you create the person as your other. So you tag that person with negativity, negative features or negative attributes. And if you tag, they are able to have the negative attributes stick to that person. Then by implication, you don't have to talk to him about yourself. Then your self become positive. Because if he is bad, then by implication, I'm good. That's what stereotype is all about. It is an effort for those in power to elevate their own positive attributes. So you do that by tagging the other person negative. So, oh, oh, this person is lazy, this person is this, this person is that. You don't have to talk about that. By implication, you are the opposite. If he is lazy, then obviously you are hardworking. If this is person is this, then you are the opposite. So that is what it works. It is an effort for the majority population to elevate themselves in a positive light. That is one thing about stereotype. Okay, nonetheless, let's continue. In the African context, most of the stereotypes trace to European exploration when they venture into Europe. The slavery, we know about it, the colonialism, Christianity has been part of it, okay? They are all intermingled into it. The use of color black as anything that has to do with sin in the Bible, you paint Jesus white, you paint God white, you paint the devil black, you paint a demon black. So it's a, it's a, you see, it's all, mixed into it. And one thing too that you have to keep in mind is that it is the production of knowledge. We are creating knowledge through all the Bible and all these books and all these theories and all this. And the production of knowledge again is embedded in power dynamics. You can say something today. You are just a high school student, somebody will say. I will say something, the same thing, and even say it works. Because I'm the pro, I have the power. And what I say sticks than what you say. So what, that is what you mean by knowledge has a lot to do with power. So normally those who have power are the ones who have ability to say what is true and remain true for everybody. If you don't have a power, it's difficult for what you know and what you say to, what, to end up being the, 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 the prevailing thought, okay? So therefore, how, how on earth, who saw the devil? Where, where did you see the devil that the devil was a black person? Or where did you see God that, or, that the God? In fact, Jesus that came to live was from, from, from the Middle East. A Middle Easterner, of course, we know that a Middle Easterner is not a white person. Okay, so this is a knowledge production. You have to be mindful of it. That's how you produce knowledge. If you have power, you set everything for your advantage. You saw the African map. You can pick it up yourself. 
Egypt is right there. But because Egypt did so much in terms of West civilization, very often uh, European ideas will take Egypt out of Africa. And then say, okay, Middle East and North America, and so they take Egypt out. So Egypt no longer, in so many contexts, will not, will not be part of Africa. Why? Because they don't want African to be the one who did anything good. Okay, so somehow Egypt, which you can find right there with your own eye, they will gaslight it and tell you Egypt is not part of Africa. Okay, so these are all some of the things that you have to keep in mind. Power, influence, knowledge. Just as knowledge influence power. And when you come to the university campus, you will talk about so many of these attributes of power, theories about power, scholars like Foucault. In fact, Foucault has a book, Knowledge Power. So these are things that you study, and I think you, are, you will enjoy it. But mostly, what you have to keep in mind is that you produce it in knowledge through books, and more importantly, through the social media advertisement, the radio, the TV, the media, what we call the culture industry. You produce it, and then it sticks. It sticks. So over the years, we repeat it, we repeat it, we repeat it. And even though it has no grounding in facts, it can stick to the person. Okay, so keep an idea of power in your mind. Now, in the African context or Africans, generally, the idea that they are primitive culture, the poorest, they are poor government, political instability, rural, poor education. So much so that if you come from Africa, I remember when I came to Canada first, people will ask you some questions. Those were in the 80s. And I said, wow, they were amazed why I couldn't even speak English. Okay. But I was educated in English. Everything was done in English. And in fact, I, was, I came in one year. I was able to do the master's in 12 months, far ahead of me, some of my men of my classmates. And it, that, I mean, we, are, we educate everybody, and uh, just like everybody educate here. We try to do our best. But people have no idea about what's going on in Africa. Uh, somebody comes from Nigeria to Canada today, you go to a high school school, so if you are not careful, depending on the teacher, they think, oh, you, you don't know anything or something. Those things are all stereotypes. Things are changing so fast. So you have to be mindful of that, okay? That is not to say that there are no problems in Africa. Of course, there are problems everywhere, but right? we have far more of the problems, but you have to be mindful of what we call stereotypes, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, Common stereotype about Africans closer to nature, more emotional, sexually uninhabited, more musical, superior athletes, less intelligent, lawlessness, criminal. These are common stereotypes about blacks, in, in, especially in the West. You see a black person, you think, oh, that, that person must be an athlete. Okay. But if, oh, I mean, if I'm talking to young people, so let me dwell on this for a bit. But you can read about the history of, say, a sports like. Um, sports like basketball in the US. In fact, those who were the best basketball players were Jews. Were Jews, you can read the history. They were the top end until later on blacks even came in, okay? And you have a situation where due to the segmentation, the labor market, you don't have a job, you have nothing to do, you live in the ghetto, you can't do anything, you are not given anywhere to go. In fact, you cannot even buy a house outside of the ghetto, so you are stuck. So what do you do? You see, that's the only thing. So they practice, they practice, they get better. It's not like they're black so they can play. No, everybody can play there. You can relate this to Olympics. Normally the high jump, those who win the high jump are always white. So why, if you think the best blacks are the best jumper, how come the Olympic high jump? You can check it out. It's white people who, who jump. So it has nothing to do with all these images that you carry. Oh, Kenyans, they can run because they live here, they are mountains and no, no, it's practice. It's pra if you go to Kenya, running is just part of their culture. People just run it. And if you do it from day one, as you are born and running to school, running here, running there, running there, uh, running, obviously you're gonna get better, okay? So that is all it is. So you have to be mindful of all these stereotypes and images that you have about people. Now, I was talking about how blacks the name and knowledge for that you've heard about blackmail, something about blacklist, 
black light, black widow, black in fact, we even have black uh, black color crime, and even and then you have white color crime, <laughs> black death and black magic. Anything that you can see that is black is obviously negative. So how if you keep on feeding into it with so many of these type of darkness tied to negativity. How on earth do you and disentangle, do you get yourself out of this type of baggage following you? Okay, but it is all creation that we create and target to people so that we will look better. I mean, you commit crime, so some of the crimes are black crimes, some are white color crime. I mean, can you imagine? And believe it or not, those who commit a white, uh, white color crime very often will not go to jail. And meanwhile, they will cause more damage. You steal, uh, you steal somebody's uh, iPod, you will be going to get, you can just do so much fraud with banking and all those things, and they will call it white color crime, and you may not go to jail. You see, that is what we mean by power. We have to keep that in mind. What to keep that in mind. Power has a lot to do with that. There are those who see no future for Africa, and there are those who think it's just a matter of time. In the academy or in writing about it, we have what we call Afro pessimists and then Afro optimists. And many of us are somewhere in between. Okay, in fact, the British magazine, very well reputable journal uh, magazine, this magazine called The Economist, I subscribe to The Economist. In 2000, they came up with a headline Africa and the Hopeless Continent. Can you imagine the whole continent is hopeless? <laughs> then in 2011, those who are saying 22 hopeless continent, they came with another headline, Africa and hopeful continent. What happened? So things are changing depending on circumstances, but generally uh, you have to be open-minded and avoid this type of blanket generalization, tagging about 20, about 54 countries, painting all of them. Uh, in what with one brush, I mean, obviously that is not a good idea. Now let's let me show you some pictures. Uh, this is a uh, high school, and it's always interesting. And now Egypt. This is the pyramid of Egypt. You can actually go there and take a look. But this is a place I've been several times. Now, even today. It will be very difficult to know how these pyramids were constructed, even today, with all the science that we have. Architects, builders, engineers are still struggling to find how they were able to construct them. The size of them, these pyramids, there are so many of them, and how they were put together. All these years, we are still struggling to know how it was done. And of course, you can read about the uh, the Nile Valley a contribution to civilization. Okay. Now, if you go to West Africa, in West, in the West, people talk about Timbuktu, and I think it's maybe some mystical place in Paris. It is a place in West Africa. It is one of the areas where there was what you can call a scholastic community, more or less something like a contemporary university. Way back then, they had universities there in West Africa in Timbuktu. Mostly Islamic scholars. These are their buildings. We we'll go there. In fact, it has been raided, and people have started digitizing what is left and stored there. They almost like a university, but it's a scholastic community, well documented. Of course, Egypt has universities and all those things way back before it came to this. The Great Wars of Benin. We talk about the Great War of China. Yeah, we have fourteen fifties. These were all walls that were built in Benin for the purposes of protection, the security, and all those. And of course, China also has its walls. But these, you can, I'm just putting this out there. You can just Google them and then find more about it if you're interested, the size of it, how it was controlled. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, you will just enjoy them. Now, let's look at this intriguing figure. There was a leader in around the 13th, 14th century called Mansa Musa. We are talk, still talking about West Africa. He was a leader of Mali Empire, one of the empires. You have to keep this in mind. The Egyptian civilization was way back then. There were some other civilization in Africa, but the Egypt, the Egypt one was the preeminent. In fact, the Egyptian civilization has a lot to do with the, the Greek civilization, Greco-Roman civilization. 
okay, the Greek and Roman civilization that became the West. Many of it traces to the Egyptian civilization. Okay, but then, of course, because you don't want to give credit to the Africans, now Egypt is not Africa. But that's how you can find it out yourself. At that time and later on, Mali Empire was there, the Zimbabwe Empire was there, the Songhai Empire, there were so many empires that were very elaborate. This gentleman was the, uh, the king or the emperor of Mali, Mansa Musa. And in Islam, they have what they call the four pillars of the Islamic faith, one of which is that if you can, you can afford it, once in a while, you have to go to a pilgrimage in Mecca. Pilgrimage is just a, a, a religious trip. You go to Mecca and then you do worship and then you come. Okay, that is one of the main four pillars of Islamic faith. Of course, then you have to say a whole bunch of prayers and give arms and you also do the, the fasting, the Ramadan, the, the four of them. One of it is the pilgrimage. So Mansa Musa went on a pilgrimage from Mali to Saudi Arabia. And on it, we took an entourage. We passed through Cairo and went through the, uh, Medi uh, the Middle East to Saudi Arabia. By the time he came back, he had given us so much gold that the whole global gold market crashed. Crashed for almost a year because he was just giving us every gold, everything. You can Google it. At one point, it's documented. You can read this easily. He was the richest, and fine, many believe he is the richest that ever lived, the richest person that ever lived. You can Google it. This is not a mythical story, it's real. You can read it about it. Now, this is the great wall of Zimbabwe. Still there, people, you can see the tourists that are there going in to have a tour. These are all obviously things that were constructed by Africa. And then people will talk about how Africans have not done anything. You have no any idea about anything. That is where you have to keep in mind the idea of knowledge and how it is produced and the power dynamics embedded in it. Okay. Now, this is in Ethiopia. Look at it carefully. It's a mountain, rock mountain, mountain. Like, say, if you go to the, the Rockies in BC or in Alberta, British Columbia, border, Rocky Mountains, they actually carve a whole building in the, in, in the, in the rocks. They carve it up. Churches in Ethiopia, they, they are there historically. This is church, they carve it inside the road. Nothing there that you brought in it. Nothing is brought from a roofing sheet or this or that. No, the whole building is carved out of the road. Okay? And this is also church in the sky. Uh, you, I'm just trying to give you something to Google and find out. This is a church, of course, the Coptic Christians. It, it, uh, Ethiopia also has a biblical story way back to some trees, David and all those. There's an old story there where the Christians, they're Coptic, they stole in rocks, high somewhere there. And this person may have to find a way to get there. And worshiper will actually go there and worship. Okay, it's church in the sky. Now, let's do cities. This is a capital of Kenya, Nairobi. Of course, it can pass for any North, Africa, North America or even European city. Okay, mind you, if you go there, infrastructure may not be, rules may not be that perfect or things like that. But this is how Africa is in some contexts. You can have a very poor areas. I will show you some. You can have uh, areas that are uh, elevated like this. And why should that surprise you? Anywhere you go, you find the same thing. You got a very rich, you got a very poor, you have in between. So these are things that you have to keep in mind. This is Johannesburg. And mostly it is just like any kind. It's like Vancouver, really. Just like a Vancouver, along the coast, along everything. This is a city right in South Africa. This is Abuja. Abuja, Nigeria, their capital was Lagos. And again, so congested, they, they decided to create a new capital in the middle of the sea or of the country. This Abuja, so you can see well graded with trees and everything. This is Abuja. Now, this is Lagos, Nigeria. You can see how the density of it, millions of people because of the population of Nigeria. Now, this is a slum in Lagos. Of course, as I was saying, 
you have the high end, you have the low end. Very often, what is portrayed to the Westerners will be places like this. Okay, people have vested interest in showing you this. If I'm trying to set up pounds to come and take your money and try to show I'm going to help these people help this, I'm not gonna show you Lagos the way I show it. I'm gonna show it and show you how poor they are and how they need this, this, they need that. But very often, not to cut the philanthropic organization out, but there have been documented situations where people just use this to collect funds for themselves. Okay, so they go, and as if they don't see the good part, they look for the worst and portray it to the worst and then use it to raise funds, most of which will not even go back there to help the people. And it's well documented. Okay, so these are very horrible. Most of the people living in slums, you call they squat. In other words, they are squatter settlement. The land they live on is not yet they build and they will bulldoze it at times, they'll come back again, they will put illegal connections of electricity and water in there, the city will come and take it out. But they are trying to very say, try to survive. People coming from the rural areas trying to make a living. Uh, that is what we mean by squatter or slums, okay? Now, this is Accra, the capital of Ghana. In fact, I'm from Ghana, uh, Accra. You can also find, uh, in fact, this is the University of Ghana where I did my undergraduate. Unit. You can Google about the size of the university it's just so big, it could be a township, very big. This is, a, in fact, this is the library alone. The library alone will, will be bigger than some campuses here, okay? I'm not saying it's better or whatever, but it's just there. You go in there, the facility may not be good, but people have universities like that. Now, but if you come here and they will just be stereotype, as if you will never even be into a university environment. Right. Oh, you can go and check it out yourself. So you just have to open up and see what's going on. At the same time, this is a slum in Accra. Okay, just like you have the slum in uh, Lagos, you have slums in most of the big cities have their slum, but people trying to make a living at the outskirts of town. This is a slum in Accra. And when it rains, it flood people, and a lot of problems in this area. Okay, now this is downtown Vancouver, of course. Okay, but downtown Vancouver. Just to make a balance, this is down east town, east side of Vancouver. Okay, how often do they portray this? Okay, so these are the point I'm trying to say is we have advanced country and we have poor country, but it is a situation where you have to keep in mind that what you can find, there are rich people in advanced country, just as there are rich people in poor countries. Okay, maybe the scale will be different, but still, there are poor areas in advanced countries, just like this one, and you can find it in so many. Even this is Canada, you can just imagine what will go on in a place like the US, if I'm from, and some of the ghettos and some of the, the, the negative parts. This is a story that is also in British Columbia. There are people struggling to live. I mean, mind you, if you're African, you live in the slum, the weather is almost always warm. Can you imagine living here and it's winter? Okay, just put it things in context. Okay. Now, so let me just try to end this by giving you some idea, putting it all together. How do you confront these stereotypes? How do you discuss Africa to make sense out of it? Okay, so to get rid of all these negativities, to have a very balanced perspective of the continent. Keep in mind that there is no silver bullet. Do not believe the hype, whether it is too good or it is too bad. Mostly, it is somewhere in the middle. Okay, if somebody is hyping it because I'm African, I'm trying to tell you Africa is all good or all that. No, 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 don't believe it. That's not true. If you see my writings, I'm one of the, the most vocal critics of what goes on in Africa in terms of the governance, in terms of the politics and the corruption, uh, okay? It's not good, okay? But at the same time, it's not bad somewhere in between. Just like it's not good and it's not bad anywhere, okay? Now, every time you have to try to balance the good with the bad. Resist this temptation as though Africa is some exotic place of uh, South. There are real people trying to eke out living. Everything has to do with politics, okay? In other words, Everything has to do with power. When you are dealing with this, 
listen to who is speaking, the power dynamics involved, who has the power to say what about somebody and have it stick. Keep that in mind. Development go beyond money. Westerners, we tend to have a lot of money. A metric has to do with calculations about who has this and who has this and these material things. If you are going to deal with African countries, you have to remember, you have to not judge people based on your own background and then you use your background to judge them. You have to determine things on their own terms. Maybe the African doesn't want to be going back and forth working every day without paying the mortgage back and forth. Their culture they don't like that. Where you pay, you get up, you go, you come, you go, you come, you are buying house, that you can't even sleep in. You don't even sleep in. Maybe that is not their life. So materially, they have orientation towards something else. Maybe they don't want to build a prison complex that you have in the US, okay, where you have about cut out the black population in prisons. So if you are talking about development, how on earth do you have half of your population in prison and you come to them, you are so developed? When you go to there, they don't have their population in prison. So it all depends on the map, what you are trying to use as a measure. Keep that in mind. How often have you heard about somebody shooting somebody in the schools in African countries? It happens all the time in the US. How often do you hear this factored into estimation of who is developed and who is not developed? It doesn't because who has the power? So it all depends. You have to be very, very creative and try to account for this from different people and different perspectives. We all don't want exactly the same, of course. Beyond the material needs of food, shelter, and clothing, which almost uh, uh, people get, the rest is just a matter of context, okay? So you keep that in mind. Be very skeptic, uh, skeptical about facts and numbers, people throwing out numbers here and there. Keep the size of Africa in context. Keep it in perspective, the diversity, the number of countries. It's, Africa is not a continent. It's, it's not a country. It's a continent with so many uh, different countries. Oh, sorry. Oh. Let me just cut this now. I will cut it right away. Mm. Now, the, there's so many countries in it. Canada, sorry about that. There's so many countries in Africa. So you have to keep that in context. Keep African size and diversity down, dig deeper on the surface, beyond the popular images. And of course, if you have the, the time, visit the continent. That's the best uh, decision you may make. Okay, so keep that in mind. And on that note, if you have any, you can uh, pass it on. I know this is being recorded. You can pass it through your teacher, pass it through your, and it is always, always gonna get to me. If you need me to speak to your class, I'll be very happy to do that. Okay, so this will bring us to the end. Thank you for, um, for your involvement. Thank you. And thank you, Joseph, for that very informative and mm -hmm. eye-opening lecture today. We're so thankful that you were able to do that for us. Mm -hmm. For those of you that are joining us remotely, I wanted to take the opportunity to thank you for joining the Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change at York University for our high school lecture series. Today's lecture in Global Geography by Professor Joseph Mansa was just a sample of the type of lectures that we offer each fall and winter terms as part of our high school outreach programming. Please contact eucapply at yorku.ca for more information on bringing our faculty of environmental and urban change to your classrooms. If you do have any follow-up questions that you would like us to address with Professor Mensa, you can also email us at eucapply at yorku.ca and we'll be sure to pass along your message. Thank you and have a great day.